Welcome to the closing keynote talk um, at our Data Summit conference. And how many of you during this conference ever went to a session in this room in track A? Which makes me wonder why I'm even introducing John O'Brien, <laughs> since John spent his two days chained to a table in this room as the moderator of track A. And we are very grateful to John for doing the moderating job and for being such a wonderful supporter of the Data Summit Conference, I think for the entire life history of the Data Summit Conference. Um, I, has anyone else been to every Data Summit Conference? Yeah, it's you and me, John. That's it. I sort of thought that was going to be the case. Yeah. Right. So you, uh, if you don't know who John is, he is the principal advisor, data strategy and architecture, Radiant Advisors. The truth is, he is Radiant Advisors. Um, and he is going to give you a sneak preview in this closing keynote of some research that he has been doing. Uh, and he's going to talk about the study that is the result of all that research. Um, has not quite been published yet, but soon. So you are the first to know about what he has found out. John. I guess that it starts off on Tuesday for those of you with me in the workshop, too, all right? Um, so what uh, I was asked to share, and I'm really excited to share, is the uh, kind of the findings that we did on a market research. So uh, my partner in crime, Stephen Fagg, you've probably seen him around here, part of uh, Unisphere Research as well. And I uh, have done work over the years. Uh, investigating the adoption and rise for data lakes, uh, cloud migrations. And then last December, we started to work on this one because you know what we were both seeing in the industry, and we both collaborate on research together, is there's a lot of new architecture trends going on. right? We, you saw here, right? there was a boot camp for data mesh. There's a boot camp for data fabric. There's uh, cloud. There's data lake house. And a lot of the inquiries I get from companies are about which one should I be doing? I mean, which one is the right one to go with? Um, as we're modernizing, migrating, uh, evolving in any of those situations. So, well, it, the answer usually is it depends. Um, what we wanted to say was, let's do this market research. And so we put together a survey. We started this last December. And uh, we ran the actual survey results um, through the month of April. Uh, got a lot of responses, got a lot of qualified data, so that was great, and then we went to work on it. And in the last two weeks of number crunching and coming up with spreadsheets and cross-analyzing this, you guys are actually going to be the first one to see the results of this, because I don't even think uh, Unisphere has it ready to be uh, released on the website or published just yet. So they're still catching up on the copy side. So with that, in our market study, um, we kind of probed into uh, the approach that I took in designing the survey was, one, just to start with the architecture definitions themselves, right? A lot of people are confused. They're like, well, what is a mesh? What is a fabric? Um, for each one of those, I, when I talk to people, I find there are different definitions, right? Uh, whether it's from the market, from the vendors, from the industry, uh, information stuff. So there's different definitions. We wanted to explore that. And then we also wanted to kind of ask them direct questions about the trends. Which one do you like? Which one do you, you know, are you researching? Which one are you adopting? Let's just flat out ask them that. So we were looking at it that way. And then as we started to get those answers back, I said, we're going to start to, let's take a look at um, each one of them. So here you have modernized to the cloud. Uh, that's a major one. And then we also had real-time analytics the data lake house, the data fabric, data mesh. Um, and for each one of these, what we considered major architecture trends, uh, the other one that's not there, but I'll cover is IoT architectures. And we said for each one of these, what are the obstacles? 
What are you afraid of? What's the hesitation? What do you think is the biggest challenges that they need to overcome? And then right after that, we would explore what are the business, biggest business benefits that you see? And we could see that kind of relationship as well. So uh, in the demographics, I'll show you kind of what our sample survey uh, group look like. But from here, you know, uh, I think we could get in, we can cross compare, drill, and I, I can tell you one of the things that I think it wasn't too surprising, but it, it did surface up pretty clearly to me, is the relationship between understanding, understanding the value, adopting, right? So when you see some things and wonder why they're not being adopted, it's probably because there's still lack of uh, consensus around those definitions. So let's jump in. I decided to put the results right up front so we could take a look at them. This is cross-comparing um, each one of the five major kind of architecture trends. And the question here was, what is your general impression? I didn't want to debate what is the definition of a lake house. I just wanted to ask, what is your impression of this? And it started on the lower side saying, it's dismissive. Oh, it's just marketing hype, right? I'm not, because sometimes I do hear from people, it's like, is this just marketing? I, I shouldn't pay attention to it. So there's that. Then there's the other kind of on the negative side. Is this risky? data governance, data security. So I, I think this is just something that's not going to take off because it's too risky. There's a neutral, right, that's uh, actually pretty high there. And then we move into positive features, right? It's positive because it's good for IT, for open data architectures, things like that, or it's valuable. It's good for enabling more BI and more data science workloads. So we had those two sides. Now, the first takeaway is what is dismissive? It's single digits percentage-wise. So this was a multi-select question, so, or I'm sorry, single select. And then for this one here, you can see dismissive is really low. So that validates that the five are pretty solid, right? So they're legit. Uh, then we move into reasonable amount of risk, uh, in my opinion. So it's low, it's kind of in that 10 to 15% range. There's always a little hesitation, concern about risk at that range. So that, I think, is kind of normal. Now, when you move into the neutral, that's kind of usually the group we can take out, but the neutral is actually the highest group. So that's kind of, it's showing things are kind of stalled in between. And then we move to positive. Now, the thing that I found really interesting that jumped out at us is, uh, wow, neutral is really low for real-time analytics. It's really high for positive. And that's how it distributed across. So, Here's our first big uh, kind of clear jump out, which is real-time analytics is being taken much more seriously by people from a general impression. Um, we also see that uh, we have this move when you go into valuable, it's still in that 31% uh, range. Um, interestingly, IoT is considered good at a, a fairly high level, and it kind of holds its own over here in the valuable side. So this measures just people's general impression, which I might under, you know, call it intent, or I might call it uh, openness to an architecture. Now, the second thing we would ask is, how well is this definition or concept understood and consistent in the industry, right? If there's a lot of confusion, people are going to be less likely to move forward. So here, uh, somewhat, that category there was a big group, right? Lakehouse, uh, Fabric and Mesh came in at around 33%. Real time was the lowest again, but that's because look at the yes at a conceptual level, it's a big jump. So that was one of the things that kind of pulled out for us. The, when I look at it's somewhat and it's improving, improving is higher. So that shows me more movement in the adoption, that it's going from a neutral to there's more information coming out. And, what we start to see here is kind of this correlation between the maturity of the trend, right? Cloud data warehousing, maybe even real-time analytics have been around longer as a concept, so it might be more well understood, more well accepted. If you look at the second category, it tended to be around the data lake house. That one's actually a little bit older um, than data fabric and mesh, which has emerged in the last two years. So these could be going through their own maturity cycles, and we'll see how they continue to grow. So now, the reason why this mattered, <laughs> so for the vendors in the room, this is why it matters. Um, but for everybody else, this is a question about budgets because it gets into how real is this, right? People are committing money to these initiatives. Because when we asked the respondents about 
do you have budget committed for any one of these modern uh, initiatives? You can see the 39% in the yes and uh, yes for uh, submitted for budget, that's 63% overall. So people are submitting budgets and getting approvals for these major initiatives. Any one of them, but it's just to say as a group, there's a, the industry or a lot of companies are definitely moving to adopt them. Now what's interesting was deal size. So maybe you guys can shed some light on this, but over a million dollars was definitely the highest at 23.8%, 24%, or the deals were less than 100K, right? If you look at the one to 50 and the 50 to 100, those two group up to say they're at either end of the spectrum, really. So big initiatives, uh, so I, I'm not quite sure which one of the initiatives, but maybe some people are thinking they can invest 100K in that. But the largest percentage at 24% is definitely towards modernization over a million dollars. So maybe that is consistent. Or if you're looking at budgets and, you know, one of the things that uh, I like about surveys that are the most fun and, and we get to share them in rooms like this, large audience, is that I almost characterize this as group therapy. Because you guys know at your company what your current state is, what's being talked, what are your budgets, and you kind of get the sanity check of, hey, we're in that ballpark, I'm not alone. So that's kind of the fun part about uh, surveys for me. So here, what we're finding is that there is this kind of relationship moving between a general impression, a consistent understanding and commitment towards budgets. Um, as an industry, whether it's vendors or people out there that are working industry publishing, then it becomes about more information, more education, especially around business value, will start to drive towards adoption. Otherwise, it's a great idea that nobody's doing. So our takeaways on this one, of course, Paramount, right around the corner there. Um, Real-time analytics uh, had the highest positive impressions. It was a huge jump. Uh, that one really surprised me. But so that means that we're looking at velocity in architecture. We're looking at scalability. How fast uh, can we move to insights? How fast can we move towards um, analytic decisions? Now, architectures themselves overall are in that somewhat an improving category. So that means we're in this kind of, like the boot camps here, more and more people are getting educated about this, educated not just how to do it and what the business value is. And then finally, there's a, this low percentage considered dismissive or marketing hype. So none of the different architecture trends kind of chalked up as, eh, that's just marketing. Right? You could almost say that about certain ones. I won't pick on any of them. Um, I don't have any favorites. I, I just look at which ones are appropriate for different companies. But you know, a lot of these, when they get pushed by different vendors, um, you know, certain ones, like a lake house, could be synonymous with certain vendors out there because they're doing the most marketing around it. But um, you know, it's the same you know, fabric, mesh as a trend. Let's call them trends, right, rather than architectures, as a trend. Lots of uh, vendors and ecosystems will jump into that bandwagon and support it with more information and, and education. So this means that uh, from the respondent side, people inside of companies, none of these are actually considered uh, dismissive, which I think validates that we're looking at the right five uh, architectures. So that's kind of our, our first kind of high level takeaway um, in comparing the different ones. So in the trends themselves, right, act, asking these direct questions, um, we are saying, which ones are you currently considering and researching, right? This is kind of early in the adoption phase, so we're not there yet, but we believe we should be, and we better start researching that. Um, modernizing to the cloud warehouse was definitely out front, followed pretty closely by real-time analytics. These two could be correlated to the maturity of both of these, right? You know, with the cloud migrations, uh, this was in the last five to seven years that it started. So as the leading edge has already moved in, the mainstream's moving in, that we have a high percentage of companies that are already working there to some degree, if not fully. So that could explain, you know, some of this, hey, we're currently considering this because there's pretty mature adoption. There's proven results. Uh, we can feel safe about that. Now the blue bars here are one of the things I do when I'm looking at this data sets is I look at groupings. So the first two are pretty close, right, above 50%. When we drop to the next tier, the data lakehouse came up at 43%. 
So 43% of respondents are looking at the data lakehouse architecture as an approach that maybe they want to move forward with. So they're starting their research there. And then it's followed by this group behind it, the data fabric, uh, IoT, and data mesh, which are all very close. Look at that, 30, 30, 32%. They're basically the same uh, statistically. So we're looking at this group as the, hey, it's getting sorted out and people are trying to keep up with it, but it hasn't really moved into uh, that mainstream yet. So more people are working on the cloud in real time followed by Lakehouse, and then followed by the fabric and the mesh. Um, that was interesting for me because I really wasn't quite sure where the Lakehouse was gonna fall um, in this mix. Now, if this is the what are you considering and what are you researching, the next one we asked was, do you feel that you could explain the compelling business value behind this architecture, right? That's gonna be the question we have to answer. And here we have the cloud and we have real time, followed by Lakehouse, Fabric, Mesh, and IoT again. Almost the same distribution. So people who are currently researching it and trying to educate themselves also have the same amount of uh, belief behind its compelling business value. So that to me is kind of a correlation. Now which one leads, I'm not quite sure. I believe there's value there so I'm gonna research it or I'm researching it and I'm learning about the business value. But each one of these seemed to be the key ingredient to moving forward, which is into adoption. Now, when we, I thought I'd take a stab at asking the same question a little differently. So let's talk about not just current, but forward looking. What do you think is gonna be the most valuable uh, to your company in the next five years? And it kinda held the same, but we saw a distinctive flip between modernizing uh, to the cloud data warehouse in real-time analytics. So when you look at what people are doing today versus where they think they're going to be uh, adding value to the company in the next five years, that comes back to real-time. So that was the one noticeable. Everything else held about the same, right? The 50s and then we've got that 40% warehouse and we've got that kind of 30% tier fabric mesh in IoT. But forward-looking, um, it looks like the movement's gonna to be towards more real-time um, analytics. So we were careful to define um, real-time analytics based on different kind of what we had searched and researched for, what is the best term to use, because we actually had real-time and IoT kind of put together, like streaming IoT data, and we separated them in the survey in the end because this was exactly what we thought might happen, is those people associated streaming IoT data is actually a different subgroup of everybody who's looking at probably streaming operational data. So our velocity seems to be the big uh, ask uh, for architectures going forward. Now, the other thing that we asked is what's the big driver? What is your company asking for that it needs in order for an architecture? Because for me, when I look at architectures, they're meeting a set of requirements for the business. They align the business strategy. In this case, I came up with three different categories if I bucket them, right, and that 49% increase operational real-time analytics. So these businesses, uh, you know, 50% of them, half of them, are looking to increase their analytics to go real-time or near real-time. It's followed by enabling AI and ML analytics use case adoption. So here, when we take a look at those two, let's specifically look at the AI and ML analytics. Do you think that there's one architecture that might better align to that? You know, um, one of the things I keep thinking is like, well, you know, you have the data science workloads, you have self-service, you also have uh, the business intelligence workload. So when you're looking at more AI and ML and you're looking at kind of the broader spectrum, you're starting, th you're starting to think that maybe that's the lake house approach, right? It's kind of bridge those two worlds into a lake house, the data lake and data science world with the BI world. So maybe that's a correlation there, I'm not sure. The second category comes into what I considered, you know, the separation between specific drivers, very specific in the use case to more general. Increase analytics and performance, enable broader analytics and self-service. So here we find that the shift was very specific in use case to more general kind of enterprise goodness, 
right? Let's just make more analytics available. In the self-service case, that might tie into, we're careful with that word, that might trigger for some people thinking about data mesh. So that might be considered as a driver in that group. And then finally, this was interesting, we had the second category that we felt, or third category, um, an integrated data management platform and then reducing uh, risk, improving compliance. This to me represented more data management style drivers. So you can see as the businesses, what they're looking for, very specific use cases, broader analytics, and then data management's coming in third. Um, I didn't know which way those, because right now I, I hear a lot of data management work, so I can see that rising to the top. Of course, um, AI is always a tornado moving around through stuff, so it could have been that. But it looks like this makes a lot of sense to me based on the groupings we have. Now, one other thing that I did want to kind of probe the architecture, why is somebody looking at a certain, uh, t one of these trends was around the type of data. Is there like some new data that's coming in? So what data are you currently using today and then planning to use in the next five years? It actually doesn't change much. We've been dealing with operational data for decades and now we're saying documents and semi-structured, okay, let's chalk that up for 10 or 15 years. So the ones that are predominant at the top in the highest category, those are the ones we've always been working with. So there really isn't like some new data Right? You could say that the next group, log data and third party data and that kind of stuff, that was the big driver behind the, the big data and the Hadoop movement uh, when that was kind of the big trend. But they're still in the picture. Um, they're pretty close. I mean, we're looking at only a separation of about 5% here. So you could almost group them together. But if we tried to build some logical groups, we could say that that kind of second set of big data and analytics could be driving more of the AI stuff. So here we're already starting to think maybe operational, uh, transactional data, document semi-structured data, which is also kind of event driven. We can look at those and say, huh, so when we see real-time analytics popping up to the top, maybe that's related to real-time operational data. Not IoT, not something new, not some message bus. So that kind of becomes a, hey, our architectures depending which one uh, architecture style you're using or pattern, it's going to stay predominantly with the operational data you're working with. And I didn't even kind of group the last ones because I think unstructured and IoT just kind of drop off at that point. But um, I was uh, uh, surprised uh, to see that, uh, you know, those first two groups landed the way they did. So then what we did is we just went ahead. So. I, we were very careful. We we're looking at cloud migrations, but is that really an architecture? <laughs> it's more of a replatforming, right? So we know that modernizing two cloud data warehouses, cloud data warehouses that are native cloud, also have a lot of neat features, and that's more of a modernizing effort than it is kind of some new kind of architecture pattern, whether it's centralized or distributed. So we just talked, we drilled into that. And one of the first things we found is Let's understand the respondents that we have, right? We're trying to figure out who they are. They're talking about uh, they plan to remain hybrid and on-premises in the cloud. So that means that these are people who have already migrated, but they've realized they're always going to be hybrid at this point. The other one that I hear quite often is it's followed pretty closely by we're going to be cloud first in analytics, which means all new projects will be born in the cloud. So we're going to be hybrid. We're going to continue to move things back and forth. That makes sense, but all new projects will be done in the cloud first. The second one, uh, grouping there, those things, uh, researching, um, early migration, selecting a cloud platform, right there at 17, 16, 11%. To me, that's more of a, a leading edge in the process, right? So these are people looking to move. We've got our highest that are already in the cloud migration. And then we've got this other smaller group on the tail end that's immature. They've already been in the cloud for a long time and they're starting to advance. So you don't see a lot of people in the advancing. You see a lot of people still modernizing in the cloud trying to figure that out. So if you're in that category, you're not alone, <laughs> right? Not everybody's out there uh, moving serverless and containers and doing all of this, what I consider you know, uh, microservices, advanced stuff, they're in the settling out their hybrid architecture for the most part. Um, 
This was the obligatory question we, I thought we had to ask. What cloud are you expected to operate in? So I didn't drill into um, multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. I just said, which clouds are you going to be in, right? If you're going to be multi-cloud in two of the three, three of the three. So to me, it was pretty as, as expected, right? Amazon and Azure are, are kind of always neck and neck, you know, depending on which quarter they're closing the gap. And then right behind them, about half of that, so 60% down to 34 is the GCP. That sounds about right. You know, when I go out and talk to companies, you know, two to one mix, that's about uh, the same. And then we fall into these other kind of grouping categories. And I figured that the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure and IBM Cloud are kind of big database vendors in the cloud in their own infrastructure. So these are kind of... IBM and Oracle customers moving into their clouds, not necessarily a public cloud. Oh, I thought that was thunder. Um, and then we've got the more specific ones for Salesforce and SAP. Now, Alibaba, we added in the list, um, and it came up with 9%. But what you'll see at the end is I don't know if the Alibaba or even the SAP ones are related to more the regional aspects of our demographics when we drilled into you know, North America, Europe, Asia Pac, things like that. So uh, I'll show you that. But I think this is pretty straightforward, right? So I, I don't think any of us are too surprised by this one. So here's kind of our takeaways. Um, I think one of the takeaways were going to be the fact that in the next five years, our survey is showing that most people are thinking about real-time analytics, and they're probably looking beyond the modernizing to the cloud, which they're currently in. Because that showed up as most valuable in the current state, but I think real-time is going to be next. It is driven by these kinds of groups. So specific business value use cases, followed by enterprise analytics value, and then third by data management value, which seems to be mostly about direct or indirect uh, business impact, right? Specific use cases, we know our ROI. Enabling broader analytics, we know that's a good thing to do. And data management is more of a, we know we should be doing it and we're kind of doing it, but not. Um, so the last kind of takeaway I have on this section was really about the business value is going to be really translated into velocity, which is going to be velocity um, at scale. So you could be looking at the cloud for at scale, but uh, a lot of this transition uh, for the business value will become not necessarily the robustness, but the speed. So that was kind of our, our second session there. Now, let's drill into the specifics. Uh, what's interesting about each one of the specific architectures, the left-hand side are what are the perceived challenges that needed to be overcome, followed by the other side. I'm always hoping the business value is greater than the challenges they need to overcome. So when we look at these, a lot of them are pretty even, right? Which means I did a pretty good job of guessing which ones I think are challenges and um, business value because it kind of splits pretty close. I mean, 1% to 2% per uh, different choice. And then, of course, across the, uh, all of them, it's usually about 10%. So overcome challenges here. It's a little bit of an eye chart, but let's see. So we've got, uh, oh, this, yeah, in real time. Volume of real-time insights to downstream applications. So it's not about dealing with the data and the processing and the analytics at scale and in volume. It's more about delivering those insights to downstream applications. How are they going to consume that much uh, analytics predictions, recommendations into those applications. That was kind of a surprise that that would bubble up, but it's very specific. And then number two I found actually really fascinating. Uh, selecting a database capable of ingesting and analyzing data in real time. We've had these databases for a long time. <laughs> um, I have one of our sponsors here, Single Store. I've deployed them in these scenarios. Um, there's others, uh, Kinetica, who's also a sponsor of this. They're capable of... Um, if you get used to it, what they do is they create table as a Kafka topic. Once you create the table in a DDL statement, it starts ingesting data in real time. There's no intermediaries, there's no subscribers, there's no special software Python program. It just runs. So that one's kind of surprising, which I think is more of a marketing issue, right? Single store needs to get more marketing out there. Um, on the business value, so we here, and those are just the top two, 
compatibility of tools, overall cost. Overall cost is usually a real-time kind of general concern. Organizational, they kind of drop off after that, I think, in the top ones here for business value. Predictive analytics for faster intervention. Very specific. In the moment, right, when a customer is doing a transaction, when something is going on, um, we want to react to it faster. Improve time, uh, real-time business analytics and insights, right? So that's a, we want to know what's going on. And then this one I found very interesting in the top three, which was faster decisions where business opportunities have a short time window, right? This is missed opportunities, right? So when we look at missed opportunity cost, we're saying that real-time analytics will close those gaps. Now, this is what I also want you to track. Real-time was the highest ranked, right, in our kind of today being considered and researched and in the future. 2% at the bottom said not familiar enough with real-time. So that's a pretty low number, and it corresponds with most people said they understand the concept at, in detail, at least for real time. So watch how this one's going to be moving up um, as we go through each of the architectures. The data lake house. So with the data lake house, we have um, the blue box there, the top one for a challenge, data governance and security. I think that's a general kind of answer I was expecting. It's like, open data, open data formats, it's not in a database, how are we securing it, it's new, you're kind of dismantling my database, so it's making people nervous as a general perception. Now the next three I grouped in gray because this is a kind of consistent problem I think for any architecture. Uh, migration from the current or legacy data architecture, compatibility with tools in the data lakehouse ecosystem, adoption of new technologies, tools, and formats. So once again, it's just a general migration from your current architecture to a new one that people feel the ecosystem, the technologies, or the skills are going to be a challenge for them. Now the business value here, um, enabling broader analytics and uh, AI and ML use cases, like I said, that's when I saw that one as a number one business driver, then I'm like, that's probably what's boosting up Lakehouse a little higher than the others, because they see that as the direct business value coming out of the Lakehouse. Data consolidation, lower cost, improved data management. And that's kind of what I would expect, because a lot of this is saying, hey, we don't have to duplicate data anymore. That's kind of the theme behind the Lakehouse. Put it in one place, open it up for multiple workloads, uh, get away from all your data duplication, sprawl kind of thing. Now here the, right, not familiar with, uh, it's creeping up 16% as we kind of move down our rankings, right? Number three was the lake house. And then you can see not familiar with is kind of moving up here. The data fabric. So you guys were in the data fabric boot camp, so you can maybe relate to these or, or kind of chime in. But the top challenges were all about the ecosystem the migration from the current or legacy, and the adoption of new platforms. So the fabric um, is known as being pretty technology-based, right? It, it's about putting in a new set of technologies that are going to bring everything together and allow end users to go in and work with data no matter where it is. Um, and then the other challenge is adop uh, adoption and proficiency with knowledge graphs. So for me, I believe the knowledge graph is one of the key components of a data fabric for the semantic layer. Um, we actually just published a white paper on this, uh, Stephen and I, and it should be on the DBT website, which is kind of a, a overall kind of my description of what a data fabric is. And there's a lot of the get involved with your knowledge uh, graphs now while you can, because you're going to need it in a couple of years when you start to tackle the fabric as this moves out of maturity. Now the business uh, value. Uh, Reduce or eliminate silos of data, so the fabric will tie things together. Uh, improved insights and understanding of data relationships came in number two. That is one of the things that I think personally is the highest value, but it's probably not enough information out there for people to say, this is about exploring relationships between data. It's about finding things through inference, um, main, mainly. So, and then improved data management. Once again, 
not familiar enough, it's creeping up as we kind of work our way down the list here. So there's a higher percentage of respondents who weren't familiar with this. Now, if you look at data mesh challenges, thankfully, the, <laughs> the top one was the one I was expecting. So I put in uh, IT organizational or process changes. Now, if you guys have been hearing and talking about the data mesh, you probably know that it's about a different way of working with data with domains and kind of business-driven organizations, uh, you know, working in their data domain. What's interesting is you have to drop to, what is that, number five, business organizational and process change. So I separated those two because I would think the number one thing I hear about Mesh is that the biggest challenge is making the business change the way that it works. And yet in our survey, the perception is that it's more of an IT challenge than it is a business challenge. So I, that's kind of thought provoking. Um, data governance and security uh, within the mesh uh, was number two. Our traditional little group of compatibility and migration uh, is there. And then on business value, right? Improved agility and scalability, right? Business oriented domains in charge of their own data, driving their own self service, working at their own speed. Um, I, tend to be in the camp of uh, some of those people that say we've been doing a data mesh for years uh, for these business reasons. It's just today it's got a good label on it. That's fine. Um, there's different names for this distributed or federated approach to managing data. But one of the biggest things is agility. Um, you know, empowering business units to work with their own data um, at their own scale. Number two, improve data ownership and data sharing among business groups. Right? It's not like, hey, everybody has to go to the bottleneck, IT, to figure out the data and who's got what and how are we going to share stuff. They can share data among themselves. That's the number two value. So that's, to me, consistent with the definition of the data mesh. And then, of course, not familiar enough is creeping up at 23% here. So we're hoping, um, our, our plan is that we're going to run this almost same survey next year at the same time in Q1 come up with the results and then be able to compare how things have moved or shifted um, a year from now. Now, streaming IoT was kind of at the bottom of our list, um, but it's interesting. So the number one challenges were data security and privacy of IoT devices, right? All the smart devices that you have, um, you know, everything from watch to different measurements, Fitbits, and um, even everything inside of your house uh, that you might turn on to a smart home. Um, data volumes and performance of analytics, right? People are thinking, hey, that's a lot of data flowing in, personalized analytics to customers. Now, the other flip side is that's a, a pretty consistent picture I'm painting, but what about all the manufacturing? What about all the factories putting all the IoT? This is industrial IoT, and it's different. So we don't know from our respondents if they're in one category or the other. I would say industrial IoT is kind of an evolution. We, I've heard of IoT 4.0 at this point. So they've been working with this data and predictive analytics for quite a while, which predictive analytics for faster inter intervention was our number one um, business value outcome. Ability to create new real-time data products. So these are companies being innovative, looking at ways that they can use IoT data to add more value, collect more data, create new products uh, that are standalone. And then finally, uh, in that top group for me was improved real-time business analytics and insights, which is our top uh, kind of being considered a trend right now. At the bottom, we drop back down to 21% for not familiar enough. IoT itself, I think, is a little bit more technical. Um, you're talking about devices, you're talking about the data that they send. Um, it's got a whole bunch of technical complexities at scale. So, you know, maybe it's not in that adoption, but real-time analytics was definitely at the top of that list. So, our challenges. Now, the main one was specific uh, business values outweigh the challenges. So that's what we're finding is that we would see across the board that there's driver. Oh, this is the squirrel from Boston Commons, if you haven't met Squishy. Um, I also find that Squishy is very uh, uh, interested in shiny objects and runs off and chases any shiny objects. So he's, uh, she's sharing with you which uh, different trends you might want to be looking into closely. Uh, 
Um, consistent general challenges, there's that group. There's a biggest fear among migrating from your current architecture, your legacy, right? People, you know, do get into the, we've been building our warehouse, our analytics platform, 10, 15, 20 years it's been in production. How are we going to overhaul that for a completely new platform type of thing? What are the new tools we're gonna to be using? What's the compatibility within that ecosystem? They're all very valid concerns, but right now I think that concern is the one that might be holding back certain technologies or architectures. And then finally, the last section here is let's, let's explore the demographics of who took our survey. So out of our qualified respondents, the first group, 36%, were in analytic roles. Data architects, uh, BI, analytics, warehousing, DBAs. The second group came from IT. So that was 16% there. And then the, the following one were executive level, and that's around 12%. So we have to take a look at these results and say it's representative of a group that is predominantly inside of the data and analytics world followed by IT. That's a good check mark for me. So I put check marks. I'm like, that's the group I was looking for. Um, the other one is kind of what are the departments that they came from? IT, IT, IT. Whether it's architecture development or operations, two thirds of the respondents are IT people or they work in IT departments. Um, that's followed by 11% in management and 5% uh, R&D engineering. And then what are the industries? Now here's an interesting one. Finance, banking, and insurance led at 14.76. I have question marks next to these because you know, we could drill into the data. We could probably try to do some deeper analysis right now. But the finance industry in investment has been a little bit notorious for being on the real-time edge reacting to trades faster, investments faster, changes in the market faster. So maybe our bump up in the real time might be from the fact that we have a good 15% of respondents coming out of the finance field. So take that with a grain of salt, right? The second group is gonna be our high tech. So our high tech could be driving bigger platforms, perhaps they're, you know, they could be software as a service application businesses, looking at lake house architectures as a more efficient way to enable more uh, BI analytics and do more data products. Um, so there's gonna be an influence there. And then it's followed by healthcare, 9% uh, and then education and manufacturing. We have that manufacturing group in there at 6%. That might be enough that's bolstering up the IoT kind of category for us. So once again, um, as we drill into the demographics, we're trying to understand our population a little better. We have a skew uh, towards the finance world here. And then uh, this was interesting for me, company size, but based on number of employees, uh, number one is the highest in small companies less than, what is that, 250 employees? And then the second is over 20,000 employees. <laughs> So the two biggest groups that make up 19% and what's that, 24% come from opposite ends of the company size. And then the third one right in the middle is kind of that, uh, what is it, the uh, 500 to 1,000 range. So as we're looking at companies that are looking at you know, these new uh, trends, ranking real time, looking at modernizing to the cloud, these are gonna be the predominant company sizes and maybe you fall into one of those categories. And then this was the last one I, I think could have some in, uh, influence, but at the same time, it's kind of what I was hoping for as a mix. You know, 51% North America, so then that's the market we're mostly in, so that's a good relationship. From a global perspective, we've got 15 and 15% 15, uh, both for Asia and for Europe markets. And then we've got another 19% that includes Latin America and the rest of the world. It's a pretty good mix if you're willing to be looking for a 50% in North America, which I'm happy with because I think that speaks to the market that we're working with most. Uh, so that I think is very representative of what we are looking for and helps validate uh, kind of the survey findings. So closing this up, um, our demographic takeaways, the highest representation areas, even though they were 15% and things like that was finance. North America, IT related roles in either small or large companies, they rank. <laughs> uh, 
you know, real-time analytics being a, a number one leader, uh, neck and neck pretty much with modernizing to the cloud. The interesting takeaway, if those weren't obvious for you, although real-time was a surprise for me, um, Data Lakehouse came in at third. So we can see most people are looking at that. And then also we have the, um, it's followed by the fabric and data mesh. So with that, I will wrap up. I take any questions. Um, I'll make this available on the site for download so you have all the statistics. And I think uh, DBTA and Unisphere are gonna publish this on their website probably within a week. Uh, so it'll be available if, if you're getting those email campaigns as well from them. And you'll get the full kind of 20-page report right up that goes into details. So, But these were the highlights I wanted to kind of take away from the, the survey and share with everybody. So with that, I can, I can moderate myself and take <laughs> questions. or He's have, so used to moderating. No, but uh, no, thank you for, uh, for staying throughout the, the entire data summit uh, so all the way to the end. Uh, appreciate Absolutely. that too. I wonder, when you showed that budget slide, mm -hmm. I think I, I was surprised at the low number on the bottom of your scale. And I wonder if that's actually related now that I saw the demographics. The small company. If it's, yeah, if, if that correlates to the smaller companies who it just don't have way. enough money to really yeah. invest. Yeah, uh, it could be because we had the, the small and the high uh, budgets, the over a million and, and less than 100,000 and we had the small company size and the big company size. So it, that could be that correlation there. Anybody else have questions for John? Yeah. Does anybody want to dispute his findings? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Michael. Nice presentation, John. Thank you. Um, no, it's just an observation. I think a lot of the smaller companies are leveraging the, the cloud Based databases like Azure and mm -hmm. AWS, where you know it's it's affordable for them. Right. So there's probably some data in that, if you will, and and what we're seeing, is yeah. especially with their participation in the survey, they're probably more aware of you know the cloud than mm -hmm. perhaps even a larger you know medium sized or larger company is. So yeah. Um, I, I agree with that. I, one of the things I was trying to do with the survey design was focus on the, whether the architecture was a, uh, a different kind of pattern, like a distributed pattern like in mesh, or um, if it was the lake house changing the way you're doing the compute and storage and the open formats. And, you know, because out of these architectures, there are all multiple ways to solve the same thing. And that's why I broke up the modernizing to the cloud just as kind of a normal staple for us to say, in general, most companies would be moving to the cloud and leveraging the, the benefits of being in the cloud, regardless of any one of those three or four architectures they chose. So yeah, I, I definitely think that's kind of a general, they are modernizing for those benefits, but what they do in the cloud is likely to be one of those other three or four architectures. Yeah, and the cloud data warehouse, um, that just means people are modernizing uh, from on-prem warehouses into kind of the you know, cloud native. The real-time information is really interesting. Yeah. Faster data. I, you know, we, we've been walking around in two days talking about chat GPT and at the rate of speed of everything these days, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm reminded. And um, that's the other thing is, you know, having covered the industry for so many years, I used to think that, you know, uh, an architecture or a trend, I've watched everything from big data to all the other ones come in, run five-year cycles, seven-year cycles. They're running two-year and three-year cycles now. The rate of acceleration um, is, is just increasing. Other questions for John? Comments? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Um, when you were talking about how they, they had budgeted for those, those architectures, do you know which ones were really? No. There was no breakdown? No. Um, I did that. Where do you think they were getting the money? <laughs> how about that? Um, Where do you think they were getting it? Okay. Where do you think they were spending it on? Which architecture? So it, that's a great question because um, I, I specifically wanted to just ask for if you have a modernizing initiative, what's the budget? Um, if you're modernizing into the cloud, there's a certain budget. Um, but I do think that uh, you could be going with 
lake house, mesh, or fabric, and it's, it doesn't matter which one, the budget would probably be about the same. I think it's the overcoming the migration from the legacy, uh, the new school skills, the new technologies, platforms that need to be integrated. I think that's where the budget's coming in. Um, I, from my own experience uh, with companies, I'm finding the usage-based billing is to be a kind of a big shock. Um, so a lot of the movement today in data observability um, makes sense. A lot of the movement in FinOps uh, for me in the last six months has made a lot of sense as companies are mo moving there and then finding out, whoa, the bills are bigger than I thought. And we probed into that on the lake house and, and they said that was one of their highest concerns because there's so many people talking about, you know, these, whether they're true or not, urban myths, right? You know, shocking bills. Um, but it's very valid because we find that things like pipelines, things like database storage up in the cloud, there's multiple ways to process, um, you know, whether it's, this is a big part of the debate I'm in always between ETL and ELT. Um, it depends on what you're trying to do in the pipeline. One could cost 10x more than the other. So when you're looking at cost, I think they're factoring in the new technologies, the usage, um, hopefully some of the skills training. Usually, I don't see that in the budgets much, but um, it's the migration effort, right? Let's go ahead and, and take our on-prem data warehouse and put it into the cloud, the budgets for that, whether you change stuff or not. So that's kind of just my own experience. So it's, it's hard to say. I don't, I don't think one architecture costs more than the other one. That's, that's the key. It's just a different way of working. Um, I, I think that the uh, debate between central and distributed um, has been going on for a long, long time. So that's not new for us. Uh, which way uh, do you want to tackle consolidation and, and centralization? Or do you, get, I don't want to say give up, but is it more efficient to simply go in place and go with the fabric and just tie things together? You know, it, it's a different story for every company. So, yeah. Mary D. Other questions? Well, you'll get the full report, mm -hmm. hopefully next week, right? Oh, so From you guys, yeah. not from well, me. <laughs> not from me, personally. It's from no, some it's other you personally, of the Mary D. <laughs> Just, so, um, that does bring us to the end of the Data Summit Conference. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to John for a Thank wonderful you. presentation. Lots of wonderful data for the data people <laughs> at the Data Summit. I, I love that we finish off with data. Mm -hmm. Seems so appropriate, doesn't it? And we hope to see you all back here next year, same hotel. You know how to find us. See you next year. Thanks again to John. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you.